Welcome to Keeping You in the Family with Dr. Margaret Aranda on the CAW 360 Network. Hello. Hello. Um, hi. You're with us. There, there we go. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This is Dr. Margaret Aranda. I'm your host tonight on Keeping You with the Family here on Con Nation uh, 360 Network. Uh, tonight's topic is microglial cell inhibitors and CRPS.
check one. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hi, thank you so very much. Again, this is Dr. Margaret Aranda. Thank you for joining us on Call 360. Uh, you can go ahead and join us either on callnation.com or YouTube. Just type in keeping you in the family and let us know if you have any questions or comments or if you want to volunteer for us as well. You can email uh, Jonelle Elgaway at jonelle.elgaway at call 360 caw360.com. And I'll take a couple of mailbag questions right here at the beginning. Uh, the first one from Loyal Fan. Uh, she takes several different B vitamins as well as C and D and magnesium, and she forgets to take them often. So she's wondering if it's okay to just take it two or three times a day instead of every day. Does that still have a benefit? And absolutely it does. I'll give you a couple little things here. Um, for supplements, you need to be careful about the product, that it's from a reputable company because the FDA is always finding companies that have no supplement in their supplements. So uh, that still is going on even in this day and age, believe it or not. Uh, for vitamin D in particular, many patients with chronic pain are deficient because they don't have much weight-bearing exercise. And that's important because you don't want to fall and break a hip, a hip and then end up in a nursing home or disabled or get a hip replacement. It's just bad all the way around. So vitamin D formulations, I like to have vitamin D3, which is a particular uh, vitamin D, together with uh, vitamin K2. So D3 and K2, D3, 5,000 units if you have uh, osteopenia. Uh, for about three months, 1,000 to 2,000 units if you're just disabled in bed and uh, you don't have osteopenia or osteoporosis. Together with vitamin K2 at about 90 milligrams, they each increase the absorption of the other. So we have to worry that just because we take a pill, it doesn't mean we're not going to fracture a bone. So we just try to make everything like as good as it can be and take a little extra effort with everything. Um, so that's very nice. Uh, and then uh, somebody asks, uh, is there a meal I would consider comfort food for pain? Oh, if so, what it would what would it be and why? I actually, in the summertime like this, it's been like 105, we're in the middle of a heat wave. I actually like um, some uh, frozen yogurt with blueberries, wild blueberries, the little bitty ones from Maine are the best. They have the most uh, potent uh, antioxidants in them. They're great for your brain health. So I like to eat foods that aren't cooked and raw as possible, um, especially in the summertime. So if I had to pick my best comfort food, I'd say it would be vanilla yogurt, frozen yogurt with blueberries on top. And then I'd do a small, not a medium, not a large. <laughs> so thank you very much. Today's topic is going to be microglial cell inhibition and CRPS. CRPS is also uh, pronounced CRIPS. Uh, it stands for Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. It's probably uh, the most painful condition on earth. It has ranks with the highest of pains, and it's also called the suicide disease. Luca also asks, I heard iron in supplements is bad. Is this true? Well, it depends on how iron deficient you are. Uh, if you're iron deficient, you should be cooking in iron skillets, so you'll absorb some iron that way. And uh, iron is very hard uh, to, for your stomach to absorb in your intestines. It causes constipation for a lot of people, and it's just not absorbed well. So, yeah, you have to be uh, careful to have a good iron supplement if you're taking one. And go ahead and take some vitamin C with that because it'll increase the absorption of the iron as well. So, no, iron in supplements is not bad, especially if you're pregnant. For goodness sakes, they give it to all the pregnant women because they need to carry oxygen on the hemoglobin molecules for the baby, too. So we want to have red blood cell health in that in that fashion. If you, this is the first time joining us, uh, welcome. But you probably need to uh, catch up with us because we already did diet, sleep, sex and sex hormones, bone joint and nerve stability, as well as anti-inflammatories that included steroids and NSAIDs or non-steroidals. We did topical and regional anesthesia with an emphasis on topical creams uh, together with an infrared uh, heat lamp. And also, I spent a lot of time on epidural steroid injections, which are not FDA approved. So I tell you all the things you need to know about that. Today is microglial cell inhibitor, inhibitors um, and CRPS. And a lot of people have never heard of a microglial cell. 
Uh, we're going to be taking a break after next week. We're going to do uh, combined therapy uh, for spinal cord injury and severe pain uh, next week. And then when we come back, we'll continue doing more pain medications as well as PRP and stem cells. Uh, PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Stem cells are mesenchymal umbilical cord stem cells are the ones that we like to use. And just to recap, I mean, these are some of my suggestions for uh, our patients in our clinic, and certainly they may apply to you. They may not. This is not uh, to practice medicine on somebody I've never met before. But you want an anti-inflammatory diet. The whole 30 has uh, millions of people who have done it already. Uh, then you check yourself for antihistamine uh, sensitivity. And if you pass through there, you get to go on a low glycemic diet for life. So you never get diabetes. Sleep, magnesium plus melatonin. Many of my patients come in sleeping for two hours at a time, and uh, I had some patients last week that uh, gave me eight and 11 hours of sleep at night. And usually that takes about six months for that transition to occur, but when patients start to feel better and then they start sleeping longer, they feel better, better. So that's always a good thing too. Bone, joint, and nerve stability, that talk is filled with a lot of supplements, including chondroitin glucosamine, the triple strength, as well as B12, I do injections. Medroxyprogesterone is very excellent for joints. Anti-inflammatories include injectable Ketorolac or Toradol, uh, methylprednisolone steroid, uh, and probably the most anti-inflammatory things you can do are platelet-rich plasma and umbilical cord or uh, mesenchymal uh, stem cells. Topical and regional anesthesia, we talked about compounding creams that your doctor can write specific recipes for that your pharmacist can mix by hand for you. And I went over a lot of supplements, over-the-counter uh, topicals as far as gels and pouches too. So you're, you can take up to 4% lidocaine without a prescription. And so there's a, there are a lot of things out there that can help you. Uh, uh, epidural steroid injections, uh, the FDA has a lot to say about those. Uh, you can really harm yourself. So you need to just be informed about what it is, how it works, what can happen. Uh, so that you know what you're getting yourself into if you need to have one or if somebody suggests it to you. For microglial cell inhibition, we're, this is a big issue with chronic pain. Uh, this has to do with neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration. Microglial cells also are very uh, adaptive. You'll see that they're not just glue. Glia is glue. Um, but many patients that are trying to diet or trying to sleep at night have analgesics of some kind are doing some uh, small exercises or uh, yoga for uh, core strength. If you add some microglial cell inhibitors to your regimen, chances are that they are definitely gonna help you and not all of them are prescription. So I'm gonna empower you with about, I think 17 supplements that we're gonna go through at the end and you'll have my nice long list there. So I, I hope you really enjoy the things we're gonna talk about. You already know this, I don't have to tell you, maybe the spouses might not know quite so much, or if you're a new patient with chronic pain after an accident, that's usually described as chronic, it meets the criteria if it's greater than three months. It's about 50 million people. 20% of our entire country have chronic, and out of these, another almost 10% or 20 million have high impact chronic pain that severely limits them as far as work and quality of life and lifestyle. So. Uh, the transition from normal brief pain to chronic pain is what microglia are implicated in. They amplify ascending pain fibers that go up your spinal cord to the brain and they modulate it. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you pictures of how that happens. The microglia are great if you have acute pain. They stay active even after you've healed and they could lead to uh, chronic activation, which is maybe not so bad for you some of the times. So the neurons are on the left there. And when we're talking about microglia, uh, they're small, there's a bunch of them, and they help. They're little helpers and they have a lot of functions and we can do things to them to modify them. And I think you're gonna uh, like all the different things we have to say. Uh, in the next slide, we can see at the left is that same neuron, and on the right side are different kinds of glial cells. The little blue guy in the top right is a, is a microglia. Uh, they hold neurons in place and supply nutrients and oxygen and help the neurons uh, keep away from each other as well as destroy and remove ones that die. So they're very influential. They're, they're, they actually pick up 
uh, cellular debris. And so they vacuum and they clean and they modulate. They change the way the neurons are acting. And they are very active. They change shape and size. And we can see on the next slide, too, there's a transition on the right there, the top left little bug, the green bug there with all the little uh, axons or feet sticking out there. Once they get activated, they, they shorten their legs, they crunch up, and they can chew stuff up and spit it out. So they're implicated in inflammation, a lot of neurodegenerative disease, including multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, AIDS, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, age-related macular degeneration of the retina of your eye, as well as just regular aging. So they are the first line of defense for injury. They change their shape and their mor morphology to adapt. And they are very complex on the inside. They have a lot of molecular machinery. And they release some substances uh, and proteinases and uh, enzymes that are pro-inflammatory. And they also can increase uh, oxygen species that are free radicals, which are not so great for you. So we'll see there's a good side and a bad side to them, but they definitely clean up uh, immature synapses and help neurons grow where they're supposed to go. So if one is shooting out in the wrong direction, they can come along and tear that piece off and point at another one in another direction. So they're quite busy little bees. There are a couple phenotypes, M1 and M2. The microglial 1 phenotype uh, is pro-inflammatory. It usually at at the injury site in chronic disease and can lead to irreversible neuron loss. So this is when microglial cells become sort of bad for you. The M2 phenotype helps inflammation, repairs, and repairs tissues as well as nerve and contributes to healing. And then future therapies are looking not so much at the two separate types, but the ratio of one to the other. And so a lot of uh, the new work is going to be concentrating on that for the future. And, you know, it gets complicated. So there's a neuron back up at the top there, and then the blue one is the microglia. Uh, the M1, M2 are to the left and to the right. So the left side is neurotoxic, and you see the neuron degenerating and shrinking inside because it's pretty much uh, killing the neuron. Uh, and the neuroprotective side is the pink one on the right, and you can see that the neuron has got a lot of nice little axons. It's got good uh, myelin over the sheet. Uh, so some drugs are going to be able to suppress or activate one or the other so that you can decrease uh, toxicity and cell death, decrease inflammation, and, uh, you know, hold off on some of that disease progression. Uh, so, uh, M and then you can even break down the M2s into A, B, and C. So it, there's a lot of science in this. I didn't want to overwhelm you with it. But there's some references there that hopefully you can see on your screen. And if you have any trouble seeing it, we can email you some links. Uh, I want to also say that each talk that I'm giving here in this series is going to be a chapter in my next book. So uh, hopefully that'll be out around Christmas time. And uh, it's probably going to be a pretty big book. Um, but it's going to go over all of these things in more detail uh, for those that want to have that kind of detail. I think the best example of chronic pain that's extremely severe is complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS. There's a lot of overlap uh, with uh, type 1 and 2. The type 1 sort of occurs after an injury. You could sprain your ankle, the ligaments, and have no problems with the nerve, but then it starts swelling and doing other things. This is the usual uh, CRPS that was called RSD or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Uh, type 2 is causalgia, where you actually do have nerve injury, and that's less common. And you can see from the slide I picked, a lot of the CRPS uh, branding of all over the world has to do with fire and burning, because it is ranked as the highest form of chronic pain that exists in medical science today. And that seems to be pretty uh, accepted. So... No matter what kind of CRPS you have, if you've been diagnosed with it, realize it's a progression of disease that can start off looking like nothing. You can sort of get yourself out of that a lot of times with exercise, believe it or not. The more you move that joint around and, and pay attention to it, the less it's going to become debilitating. But both types of CRPS can have autonomic dysfunction, such as dysautonomia, where you're faint when you stand up, 
or you just get dizzy when you stand up, orthostatic hypotension. If your heart rate goes too fast with that, you could have POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Your temperature can go from hot, cold, hot, cold, like you're having uh, hot flashes all day or cold flashes. Most people get cold hands, cold feet, and swelling of the hands and feet too. Your extremities can turn purple, uh, red, pink. Uh, they can get edematous. They can swell so much that you need diuretics to get rid of the extra water. Um, and also, if you have an injury on a left leg, uh, that's CRPS, it can actually jump over and just go to the right leg too. So uh, you can have problems with sweating. Almost everybody, I had, almost everybody has difficulty keeping their bone structure uh, active. So there's a lot of osteopenia and osteoporosis. Uh, people also have a lot of visual problems. And in case we have some medical professionals here uh, watching the show, um, I also have uh, a list of uh, by systems uh, that uh, you can use to look for associated symptoms with this disease. And it's a long list. So doctors, nurses out there, patients have a lot of really general complaints, fatigue, memory loss, weakness, lethargy, brain fog, brain injury, nausea, vomiting, pain 24 seven or central pain, changes in the way they per perceive or process the pain. The skin can have all different colors and be swollen and mottled. A respiratory system, it's interesting, CPRS, CRPS is more likely to form in you if you have a history of childhood asthma, probably because there's some autoimmune things related to that. Heart rate can be fast, palpitations, POTS and dysautonomia we mentioned. You could have slowing of your stomach and intestines, gastroparesis, everything from irritable bowel and heartburn, diarrhea, uh, to incontinence of both the urine and stool. Your muscles can jerk out while you're sleeping. They can get stuck in a spasm. Uh, you can maybe not wear a watch because you have so much electricity in you that it makes your watch watches break. Uh, we see uh, leg swelling, arm swelling, and then over time the muscles will atrophy and just waste away. And sometimes the nerves, the tendons, and the joints get get contractures. So uh, the bone strength is always a big consideration too. So you can have difficulty starting a stream of urine. You can have uh, penile dysfunction, burning pain in and around the rectum, the testicles, the vagina, or the clitoris. And that's a chronic pelvic pain syndrome. The endocrine system can be all low. You can get pan uh, hypopituitarism, where your pituitary gland just doesn't even talk to your organs anymore, your thyroid, your testicles, your ovaries. Uh, your, you know, so that your your body sort of de uh, starts to decompensate a little bit. Uh, your kidneys can have some difficulty urinating. Uh, you can keep a lot of leftover urine in your bladder that you don't know about. Uh, so I send all of my patients for a bladder scan, ultrasound to check the volume after the bladder is empty to make sure there's not too much in there. Otherwise, a lot of patients will have a neurogenic bladder. So you basically have to get up and go to the restroom every two hours, whether you think you need to or not. Uh, and then uh, Luca's asking, how do you get a diagnosis of CRPS? Well, you just walked right into our next slide there. So this is what it starts off looking like a lot of time. It doesn't really look like much, does it? The skin's a little pink, it's a little swollen, and boom. Yes, they injured themselves, that's uh, below the knee, and uh, that's how it starts. So really, uh, you complain of pain, you complain of an injury, and some swelling and redness, initially from an injury. And then the next slide will show how it can progress. So depending on when you come to a doctor and how long you've had it, there are three stages that have been described. Uh, you can see them right there. So the beginning, you can have muscle spasm and your can might get super cold. You could have a super hairy arm even. You could have fast hair power growth there. And, and uh, somebody blowing on your arm could cause excruciating pain or you may be unable to wear clothes or take a shower because of the weight of those things on your skin. You're not making it up. It's not all in your head. Later on, that muscle weakness will uh, will catch up to you, especially if you're not moving it. And your joints can become so, so stiff that in stage three, you've got irreversible contractions of your limbs. So that's really extreme. 
Uh, so in the middle stage, you have slower hair growth in the extremity. And certainly over six months uh, later, your whole arm, your whole leg can be involved. You could have 24 seven intractable pain and you could just be basically very miserable. And here are some pictures. So the left side is more than that, more than stage one. Uh, they started off pink and you can see the, this is very, very typical. The bottom of the legs there, how it's blotched and spotty, a little bit of brown, a little bit of yellow eventually it'll turn to purple and red. You see that in the second and third images. And it, uh, you, the third one is particularly modeled. And uh, a lot of these patients have severe, severe swelling of the extremities too. You can see the second picture from the left there, her two legs, one is more pink than the other. So she's got it on the right leg and the left leg is normal. And then late stage is the last picture on the right. The, the joints contract because you're not walking, you're not moving, you've got muscle atrophy, you can't even hold your weight up. This is probably somebody who's been in bed for years and nobody was really watching them. So they developed a permanent contracture. So that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that we see. So acute pain is kind of good for you. You pull your hand away from a burning stove. Chronic pain though, you know, you've got some inflammation, you've got some neurotoxicity. Uh, there's some talk that a, P, a PET scan with positron emission tomography may actually qualitate and quantitate glial cells. Uh, so you can diagnose microglial activation and treat with an immunomodulator. That's the future. When you feel sick from pain or the flu, those are microglial cells that are making you throw up. So everybody's got them, everybody uses them. Uh, it pushes the acute pain into chronic pain and it makes them smarter. They become more adapt over time and they can uh, get activated faster, stronger and maintain that for a more prolonged activation time. And then if the chronicity continues, then that's when we get into the pain syndromes. Here, this is a brand new paper that just came out June 22nd, uh, just giving us more information about how the microglia are super sensitive to their environment. They've got all different kinds of receptors. The quality matters, the quantity matters. It's not just how many, but how well they work. And your diet, are we surprised by this? Your diet can affect the way your microglia act. Uh, particularly dietary fat fatty acids and lipids, uh, your sex hormones and your gut microbi microbiota, your natural bacterial enzymes in your 27 feet of intestines really matter here. And that's why probiotics may be a really good thing for you to optimize the immunoregulation. Uh, so as far as uh, chronic microglial cell activation, nutrition plays an important role for prevention and treatment of progressive dysfunction so that you can try to take a little bit of command over these microglia to try to orchestrate the neuroinflammation. That's what the doctors are uh, trying to do. Uh, Jonelle asks, what do you think about neriodronate for CRPS? Italy states it's a cure. Uh, I don't know that drug, so I'm not sure, but I can look that up and see. Uh, other countries certainly are good at coming up with things that we take a little bit more time with. Uh, I think in this particular disease, stage one, the early stage, is it's super important to move that extremity around and to try not to let it progress to stage two. Uh, and then once you're stage two, it will probably keep going to stage three. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of things that we can do with this and that's why uh, I wrote this talk. So you'll see at the end, there'll be a list of supplements and a list of prescription medications that I'm aware of. And there, I'm also including some things that are on a trial basis. So maybe that one's actually on my list, but I may not really remember that one. So we'll see at the end. And Whitney asked, vomiting with this disease in chronic stages is normal. Well, vomiting continually is never normal. But it's normal if you have gastroparesis, your gut doesn't move, your stomach doesn't empty its contents, then sure, you're gonna feel like vomiting every time you eat. You're gonna get nauseated because your stomach can't move the food forward. So if you have chronic vomiting, you should get tested, and I'll go over some tests with you to see if we can quantitate that. We had a patient in our clinic, I sent her for an upper GI for this, for gastroparesis, and they actually found a Bozar. 
which is a collection of sediment that just sits like a rock in the stomach and it doesn't go anywhere because it can't, your body cannot uh, enzymatically break it down. It stays there. So the, let's talk about the kind of drugs to do uh, that, that can help us get rid of some of this or heal it. First of all, it must cross the blood brain barrier. That's absolutely number one. Once it does that, it won't be, we need a drug to suppress the uh, production of neurotoxic mediators and then eventually be protective. So we start with plants and their compounds. I like going a little bit alternative medicine E on you here and giving you some options so you don't have to depend on doctors writing prescriptions because I think God gave us a lot of herbs and, and plants that can help us. Uh, number two, there are new methods to existing drugs uh, that are it's subsequently found out, like in the last 10 years, that some of these are microglial cell inhibitors, and they're using some of these drugs for chemotherapy, for brain tumors, glioblastomas, when they're for diabetes. So um, I have a list of that for you at the end, too. And then new drugs. They're always thinking of something. So, yeah, it'd be nice to have uh, some new drugs that can... Uh, work at these different morphological changes that the microglial cells have. The blood-brain barrier bears a lot of discussion here because all these drugs and all these things, got it, they've got to pass through and get into your brain and the cerebral spinal fluid around your spinal cord too. So this has to do with the blood supply. Uh, the blood vessel wall is made out of endothelial cells. You see the round red blood cells there. The walls are endothelial cells. They're not a smooth uh, hose. It's not one big piece. It's a, it's a quilt. A bunch of endothelial cells are held to each other. You can see uh, the purple astrocyte, the brain cell, its feet are all over this blood vessel. Well, these guys are the ones that are, are going to be modulating how everything works. And uh, when you see edema of the legs, it's because of vascular permeability. That blood vessel has opened up and it's letting water too much water out and that's why your extremities are getting swollen for example so the when you think of the blood brain barrier you're talking about uh, blood supply neurovascular function the astrocytes and the uh, something else called tight junctions the junctions are in between the endothelial cells and here's a cross section of a blood vessel so the pink part on the right in the middle is where the blood cells would be. The round part around the edges are separate endothelial cells like a quilt, and there's spaces in between them. Those are very, very, very complicated spaces. Uh, so when this gets disrupted, that's when you get edema. That's when you get increased interstitial pressure. If it's in the brain, you could get increased intracranial pressure. It can compress on things if it gets swollen. It can alter uh, tissue perfusion and lead to ischemic stroke. So all these defects in vascular permeability have been uh, extensively uh, researched. And uh, uh, areas without a blood-brain barrier, yes, there's a few areas in the brain that, that don't have the blood-brain barrier in them. The, the posterior pituitary gland, for example, it secretes hormones directly into the bloodstream. So there's yeah, like a little bit of some exception to how this works, but for the most part, your entire brain, the point of all of the drugs we're going to talk about, getting them in the bloodstream, getting them through the tight junctions between those endothelial cells and into the extracellular matrix so it can decrease inflammation and influence the, the cells there. Um, and then... Uh, let's see. So at the end, we're going to have a list of drugs that uh, cross the blood-brain barrier. There's probably too many to mention, but I'm going to talk about that too. Uh, so anything that passes the blood-brain barrier certainly has the potential to help the symptoms of CRPS. Uh, uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, they can. They can, they can uh, cross the blood-brain barrier. That's why they help your headaches, right? So um, Let's talk, this is just a focus on vascular permeability because there's so much swelling of the extremities with CRPS. Uh, you can see the upper top section uh, where that blue thing is in the middle between the two cells. That upper section is the tight junction. And then there's another one below it where the purple uh, lines are going sideways. Uh, that's deeper in the middle of these uh, endothelial cells and that's ad adherence junctions. So these are the 
the guards at the gate that decide what gets to go through and go into the brain and what stays out. And it's influenced by a lot of different things. There are transport vehicles, ions, water. Uh, they regulate the permeability or how it, things can go in and out. It serves as a fence. And it limits free movement because you don't, don't just want everything you eat to go straight to your brain. You, you, we'd all be poisoned a long time ago. So a lot of this is, is, is our immune system protecting us. And the uh, microglia are part of the immune system. They're the, the brain's immune system. And there are these uh, adhered junctions down where in the middle of the cell area allow for cells to stick to each other when needed. And so they actually allow cells to talk to one another and touch each other uh, directly. So when we see that, we can understand there's a lot of edema over there. Uh, this uh, CRPS was coined in 1994 for pain that was out of proportion to touch. Clothing, water, air, very painful. That's allodynia. That's a thing for sure. So uh, it was formally called RSD. It is an autoimmune disease. So an armor leg injury can become 24-7. You can get CRPS after a heart attack or a stroke also. Um, and by the time a leg looks like this, you probably can't press on it very much. Even though it looks swollen, I find a lot of these legs are as hard as a trunk of a tree. There's no give. And these patients have burning 24-7, incredible intractable pain. They suffer greatly. Here's a hand. I mean, that's, look at that edema, right? I mean, it's, it looks so completely different than the other hand. This is the suicide disease. Uh, it's also called SUDEC atrophy. There's about 50,000 new cases in the U.S. And the pain scores are 10 out of 10. So nobody can tell me a pain score is not valuable because having a baby is a 10 out of 10 and CRPS is a 10 out of 10. And CRPS over and over again has higher pain scores than childbirth, amputations, and cancer. Uh, usually... The limbs are involved. It's usually after an injury, although they have found some families that it runs in. Uh, in about 35% of patients, it's not just an arm or leg. It's from the neck on down. The whole body has CRPS. They, like I said before too, it can jump over to the other leg and CRPS is known to invade internal organs as well. There's another hand uh, that's more late stage, right? And the uh, and it's jumping over to the right hand too. Both of those hands don't look normal to me. So to diagnose this, it's usually the pain is much more than anyone would expect. It seems exaggerated. The muscles are super weak. If I pull your arm, you can hardly pull back from me. You have no strength, which means you're a big risk if you fall. You're not going to be able to lift yourself and stop your head from hitting the ground. And you're probably going to break an armor leg again. Uh, so a lot of times these joints look hot because they're so pink and red. And sometimes they are actually warm. And because the blood supply is compromised with the tight junctions and the endothelial cells losing their vascular permeability, the nails can become brittle and the hair can start being really coarse in the beginning, but then get slow. So any small thing, a minor cut or a bruise can just be horrific. Now, there's a lot of studies that have been done in the lab. If you're a mouse and, you, and we inactivate a quarter of your microglial cells, they get strong pain blockage. So, yeah, it's possible to block the pain of CRPS. And that's what a lot of people are going to be working on. So uh, they don't know how it works exactly to, to make the pain go away. But a lot of people are going to be working on specific uh, microglial cell inhibitors in the future. And even a year ago, uh, Watkins did a human trial with a microglial targeting drug uh, for arthritis. So you'll find bits and pieces, and we'll talk about some more, too, at the end of the show when we're getting uh, on the wind-down section. So here we're going to talk about over-the-counter herbal uh, supplements first. And I think this is very useful, especially if you don't like to go to the doctor or you've maxed out on them for one reason or another. Herbal plants and botanicals have been extensively researched in this arena, uh, usually for uh, uh, neuroprotection. A lot of these are ancient herbals for China or, the, or Asia. 
Uh, they can definitely prevent neuronal cell loss, improve memory, treat neurodegenerative disease. I have lists for you of things that these medication, uh, these supplements can treat. And they are anti-inflammatory and antioxidant as well. And they definitely offer brain and spinal cord protection because it, they help nerve injuries. Probably the number one supplement would be ginseng. And the number one ginseng at that would be red, red ginseng. So it's, it's felt to be all healing. That's how it was named, uh, the genus Penex. You can dry it, eat it, brew it, uh, have a tea from it. No matter what kind it is, it will help you. Uh, they can stop DNA damage, induce cancer cells to die. That's what apoptosis is. Apoptosis is planned cellular death. So they can constructively hit cancer cells and make them die. They can also stop tumors from getting bigger, inhibit cell proliferation. They can act as chemotherapy or be in combination with chemotherapy. And there are a lot of papers that show they decrease cancer, the pharynx, the, or the, you know, the swallowing esophagus part, uh, uh, the stomach, liver, pancreas, and colon. So every single supplement that I mentioned has something like those last five things there where they do a conglomeration of things. But because we don't have a whole lot of time for that, we're... I'm gonna give you a shortened version and we're gonna go through these a little bit fast. Ginseng number one, especially a uh, red ginseng. Curcumin together with black pepper. We covered that in the anti-inflammatory section and it's equally as well here. We also covered number three, e.g. Uh, CG, green tea. It's from Camilla Sinensens. So that's a wonderful thing. Ginseng, curcumin, green tea, resveratrol. Red grapes, we spoke about this one too. You can get them in grape seeds, which is why you want to get grapes with seeds in them, as well as pomegranates. And then uh, gastrogodin uh, is uh, from a plant also. It's helpful with stroke and seizures and dementia as well. And then on the next slide, there's more. Gingerol, that's, a, that's actually a different, you know, so the picture's up at the top, it kind of looks like curcumin, but a lot of these are roots. Uh, that's one. Obovatol, Inflexin, Piper and Reishi mushrooms. So there's a lot of good stuff to work with there. And this is the last page. I just put a conglomeration there for you. Vaccinium, Berberine, a lot of people take Berberine. Uh, Actually, vaccinium is from blueberries, so that's why it's one of my favorite anti-inflammatory foods. But it's got to be the wild blueberries from Maine, the little teeny tiny ones. Uh, and then the berberine, Epimedium brevicornum maxim is a Chinese herb, also known as horny goat weed. Uh, men can use it for uh, infidels. Uh, Isodon japonicus, uh, that is used a lot in Asia, tetrandine and fangancholine is is another one, as well as stinging nettle and plant flavon flavonoids. Uh, there's a list of them there, and you can find them in strawberries. So go ahead and eat strawberries and blueberries. And listen, they're all over the internet. These are additional ones over and above the ones I just mentioned. Luteolin, Pipira, Katsura, Stefania, Tetranda, stinging nettle, Pyco, Pycnogenol, Boswellia, a lot of people have heard of, Kratom, a lot of people have heard of, and CBD or cannabinoids also are microglial cell inhibitors. And there's a Stanford paper that lists all of those that I just mentioned on that one page and the references on the bottom for you. So in our clinic, uh, we prescribe. We prescribe microglial cell inhibitors for different reasons, but uh, for pain. Uh, but many of these drugs do other things too. Acetazolamide is a diuretic. It also makes the urine uh, more alkaline and less acidic. Diamox is the other name. Tizanidine uh, is for uh, spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis. It calms down the spinal cord. Metformin, diabetics on metformin to decrease their blood sugars live longer than patients the same age who are not diabetic and not on metformin. So it's a big, huge uh, anti-aging medication as well, probably because it's also a microglial cell inhibitor. And I have patients I put on small doses, 500 milligrams of metform metformin even once a day, and their pain goes down. So nobody can tell me that opioids are the only thing you can take for pain because most people haven't tried metformin for pain. There's a lot of stuff out there for pain. 
minocycline, low dose minocycline is actually really good. It's even in trial for treatment resistant high blood pressure. It's an antibiotic. It's from the tetracycline class. So it has excellent specificity for microglial cell inhibition and a very, very safe profile. You almost can't hurt anybody by giving it to them. And the low doses are more effective. So you don't even have to take a lot of some of this stuff. Peroxisome proliferator activator receptors, there's whole bunches of drugs that are, that are in this category. They regulate gene expression. And uh, so those are, that's another big one that's probably going to grow. A lot of people have heard of low-dose naltrexone. This super low dose. It's an opioid antagonist, so if you're already on a lot of opioids, you may hate it. You may not do well on it at all whatsoever, but it's probably a really good drug to try if you're not on any opioids because you could get away with having a little touch of this and it can go a long way in some patients. Dextronaltrexone is another one that does not block opioid receptors and that one may be better tolerated if you're already on opioids and you cannot tolerate the low dose naltrexone. Dextromethorphan is found in cough syrup to suppress cough. Low doses, again, are more effective in studies. And rifampin antibiotic, that inhibits microglial cells as well as the inflammatory markers, interleukins and tumor necrosis factor. And then we're wrapping it up here. More prescriptions here because I wanted to empower you with, you know, a lot of choices. Pentoxifilin, I just started putting almost every single patient in my clinic on this. Uh, it, is, it has several other different names. It's usually given for claudication or leg pain when you walk. It improves blood supply, especially to small areas like the spinal cord and small areas in the brain. It's used in Alzheimer's, stroke, and it blocks allodynia in mice. And remember, allodynia is when water hurts your skin, air hurts your skin. Um, and the other thing about uh, pentoxifilin is only comes in one dose and is only an ER, an extended release. So, and most people are tolerating it, tolerating it extremely well. Uh, I have two patients. One, it apparently perfused her uh, femur really well, her upper thigh bone connected to the hip bone. She had something called avascular necrosis of the hip uh, from steroids, long-term steroids. Uh, for pain and uh, an inflammatory problem, a retinoiditis, and it went away in three years and she did not need a total hip replacement and she's a physician. So as it, it can help in unexpected ways. I have a patient who is a brand new patient. We put her on this in the first month she was with us and she had had a heart uh, attack with bypass surgery and a lot of plaque in her carotid artery in her neck. So uh, that actually made her brain open up a little bit more. She's a mortgage uh, lender, so she's crunching numbers all the time, and pentoxylin helped her in the first 30 days. You can also see antibiotic ceftriaxone, uh, copoxone, uh, ibidulast, baclofen, which is used for uh, multiple sclerosis uh, to calm the spinal cord as well. And there's a list right there of more microglial cells in clinical trials for neuropathic pain that have a great chance of being applied to uh, inhibit microglial cells as well. And that's all in a day's work. So if you have uh, chronic pain and it's 24 seven, especially if it's in an extremity, make sure you don't have CRPS uh, and if you do, move it around in the first three months, try not to get it to stick again too much. Uh, and uh, can it change over time and get better? I think it can, it has a better chance of that in the early stages. It's, it, there's really not much you can do if it's already in both of the legs and it's really hard and red. Um, you just need to pay extra attention to it because some of those people have neuropathies and they can't even feel uh, their legs quite so much. So they step on things like diabetics might and they need to have a lot of foot care. Uh, Rich asked, besides more funding for new drugs, what else is needed for CRPS? Well, I think that uh, just awareness is, is a number one thing, that people know what it is and what it's called and uh, how it can progress. There, it's easy, to, especially if you have a child that hurts an ankle uh, and it turns red and swollen, uh, to sort of think the worst if you know about CRPS. 
But then if you know about CRPS in those early stages, then you're sort of empowered to think, well, I need to move it so it doesn't go into stage two or stage three. I want to stay far away from that. So you want to be aggressive and you want to take chances and you want to like not be uh, too uh, easy on an extremity like that. It can You can get a lot of bang for your buck and stay in a lot of trouble if you are a little bit more aggressive in moving it around. Uh, can, do you treat different stages of CRPS with a combination? Um, most of the patients that come to me are already in the late stage. Uh, and sure, we do a lot of things uh, for the individuals depending on whether they have sores, open sores, in addition to the mottling. Um, so we use a lot of the topical creams on closed skin. And then we use, I use a lot of diuretic. I use, uh, if I give uh, hydrochlorothiazide, that's an easy one to start off with. It can lower the blood pressure. If you use something like furosemide, you have to give potassium with it because you'll lose it. So yeah, and uh, if the extremity swelling goes up above the knee, especially, uh, and it jumps over to the other leg, that person's going to be on diuretics for the rest of their lives. And I treat all my patients with combinations. So the slide that we showed at the very beginning that had uh, the topics of uh, these lecture series so far, by the time my patients are here for four months, they've gone through the first four stages of protocol. So by the time a patient is here with us for four months, they're probably on 20 different medications. So yeah, I believe in polypharmacy. Not everybody can take everything. And if I give you 20 medications, including turmeric and resveratrol, uh, and you respond to each one, one to 2% only, 2%, 20 medications, and we can hope to make you 40% better with that. I don't know anybody that would rather have a pain of six than nine or 10. Six is a big difference. You can live your life. You can stay out of a wheelchair. You can go places with your family. You can work from home. We have a significant number of people that are extremely advanced in their disease, but they work full-time jobs. So yeah, I make a difference with them. I treat them differently than the ones that don't have a job. Why? Because they have to function and they're doing something. If you don't have to function and you're at home, you don't need as much. And that's you know maybe an ethical debate too. But uh, yeah, I wanna keep people working, especially if you're a man and you've got a wife and kids, and especially if your wife is disabled too. I have a lot of people that want to contribute. They want to pay taxes. They want to work. They don't want to be on Social Security. So that's, I think, one of the best things that we can do is to, to keep you out of that and get you, uh, keeping you in your family, which is why we named this show, Keeping You in the Family. And I want to thank you uh, all for being here. Uh, what about swelling in legs and what if they start to leak? Yeah, some people get weeping legs where there's actually some fluid or some uh, sweating or uh, watery stuff that looks like it comes out of that. I think that, you know, that's a very individual question. I'd have to look at it myself and touch it and feel it. However, chances are that that's a neurovascular problem. The endothelium and the nerves around it are compromised and the tight junctions are open and there's water leaking out that it can actually go to the surface of the skin. So those patients probably can uh, do with a diuretic, but some other new things that they're doing, they're doing ultrasound uh, to the brain even to open up the tight junctions long enough to let medications go in there and then it fixes itself when you uh, uh, take off the ultrasound, it kind of goes back to a tight junction. Uh, I think uh, there was uh, another country, they bubble uh, uh, water bubbles, uh, I'm sorry, air bubbles in the bloodstream up to the brain, and that carries medication in. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot, a lot of uh, different methods uh, diffusing through that base, uh, the tight junctions, uh, going on a transport molecule, all kinds of different ways to get uh, cells and medications into the brain. So that's always going to be something that a lot of people are going to be looking at, especially peptides uh, and uh, piggybacking on like a Trojan horse. Uh, you can piggyback some medications on something that you know will go through those tight junctions and sneak them in like the Trojan horse, you know, like they did in the Bible. So thank you guys for your time and, and uh, spending an, an evening with us here. This is Call 360 Network. You just got your daily dose of truth. So thank you very much. It's July 17th, 2019.
Uh, definitely tune in. Uh, today is Wednesday. On Sunday, Claudia has her show at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, she has Joe Broadmeadow with her. He has a 20-year experience as a Rhode Island uh, Police Department, and he was also in the DEA, the DEA agent on the task force. So that's going to be an interesting one, right? And then, of course, Dr. Klein is on uh, later on uh, next week on Tuesday at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time also with the Doctor's Corner. And you can uh, email Jonelle with any uh, medi uh, bag questions that you have for any of us at jonelle.elgaway at caw360.com. So stay in your family. I want to help you uh, keep, keep you in your family, keep you out of a wheelchair. So keep learning, keep growing. Uh, and try some new things. Step outside of your safety zone. Take chances. Redefine yourself uh, because I know you're beautiful in and out and there are a lot of good things ahead of you. So take care. God bless you and look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank, Thank you, you so, so very much. much. Thanks for joining us for Keeping You in the Family. Program copyright 2019 by Dr. Margaret Aranda and Call 360. All rights reserved.